Uh, so tonight we'll be talking about um, equity and social determinants of health. And this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart, but this is also an interesting perspective to take on this work because now we're going to be thinking about these issues in the context of our work with um, patients with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families. So I will be uh, stopping at different points during the presentation to invite you to ask questions and you'll also see there will be points at which I will be asking you a few questions as well just to try to make sure this is uh, as interactive um, as possible. So um, as you know, the MILEND project has four core considerations using the acronym LIFE. They are leadership, interdisciplinary, family-centered care, and equity. And today we're going to be focusing on the equity component. And a key aspect of equity is looking at social determinants of health. So that's what we'll be focusing on tonight, but in some of our upcoming workshops and even throughout the rest of your training, our goal is to interweave uh, some related concepts. So in today's session, I would like to make sure that I help you identify key social determinants that impact the health and well-being of families and children in Michigan who have developmental disabilities or are dealing with autism spectrum disorder. We're also going to explore how environmental and social barriers might impact health outcomes and the ability of persons with ASD or developmental disabilities to access care and services. And then I hope to highlight a few strategies that might help you address disparities in health when you are serving this population. Now the issue of equity and social determinants of health is really a lens that can be applied to many situations and populations. And though we are focusing on uh, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities tonight, I thought it would be good for us to start by taking a snapshot look at disability in America in general. Um, I found some data from uh, the U.S. Census that tells us that over 54 million people in the United States have a disability and 35 million have what we would characterize as a severe disability, which means they need help performing functional activities or they have other mental, emotional, or social conditions that affect their everyday life. So this shows us that people with disabilities are a large and important group of health consumers in the United States. And according to a recent report, people with disabilities have poorer health and use health care at a significantly higher rate than do people without disabilities. So this really emphasizes the importance of us applying the equity lens to this population. Now I know you just finished participating in a, a webinar focused more on some policy issues around the Affordable Care Act and uh, people with disabilities. And so I thought it would be interesting just to take a moment to reflect upon some of the key considerations in that act. And if you notice, 12, which I have highlighted here, um, really says that we should, as part of that act, increase the disability and cultural competency of providers. And I think that is why the designers of the MILN program thought it very important to make equity one of the key pillars of this work. In addition, as we know, the Affordable Care Act uh, speaks to things like avoiding, uh, pro prohibiting discrimination, seeking input from disability organizations, engaging resource centers, collecting state level data so we can see how we're doing, and making sure that we're providing services that reduce mental and physical disability. So when we um, talk about being culturally competent and trying to meet that uh, objective that we viewed in the last slide, we know that a core approach to being culturally competent providers is that we consider issues of equity and social determinants of health. And it's very interesting when we think about the concept of disability in context because when we do that, we can realize that disability should not really be considered as a personal attribute or even a limit to impairment, but really it's a situation that can arise from the interaction between the person and his or her environment. 
And this is very important because if we're trying to reduce situations of disability and really maximize people's ability, that's going to require that we reduce any of the external and environmental barriers that are preventing people from fully participating on an equal basis with others. So considering that then, we can really view disability as a relative com con uh, concept. And then thinking further along those lines, if we want to think about the disadvantageous experiences or positions that people with disabilities might have in, us, in our society, we can rationalize that maybe it's not really because of their individual characteristics, but more so it's a reflection on the limitations that our environment and external barriers are imposing on them. And as such, disability might really be thought of as a result of how society is organized. And as we continue our discussion today, you'll see why that concept really is important. Because when I'm doing this equity work, this is a quote I really like us to uh, like to include, that for me, context is the key. And from that comes the understanding of everything. And I mentioned equity as being a lens that we could apply to various populations or topics. And so as we apply the equity lens to our work with the uh, autism spectrum disorder and intellectual developmental disability population, thinking about the context in which we do that work is going to become very key. As we think about context, often we have to challenge ourselves to ask questions. Uh, we don't have to always feel like we have all the answers, but it's very important to ask the right questions so that we can make sure we're providing the best care possible. So in that spirit, I have a few quiz questions I'm going to ask you as we start uh, this presentation. And as we continue, you'll see the answers for those, and it might even spark some discussion. So uh, Mike, I'm going to now go to the first question. And I would like you to poll, uh, to put down your answer, enter your answer, and then we will poll and see uh, how we did as I give the correct answers. So the first question is, how does American life expectancy compare to other countries? I'd like you to take a look at that and then enter your answer. OK. The second question is, on average, which of the following conditions is the strongest predictor of your health? Next question. Children living in poverty are how many times more likely to have poor health compared with children living in high-income households? And final question, the most important factor behind the 30-year increase in U.S. life expectancy during the 20th century was which of these options? Now these questions uh, came from a website, Unnatural Causes is Inequality Making Us Sick. And this is a PBS documentary that was uh, launched in 2009 to deal with the issue of racial and socioeconomic inequalities in health. It's a seven-part documentary series, and it's made up of uh, several episodes, each is a half hour except for the first one. And I really want to share this as a resource if you're interested in learning more about this topic. But we borrowed those health equity questions. And I also would like to show a brief clip that will um, help explain a little more about the concept of social determinants of health. There's one view of us as biological creatures that we are determined by our genes, that what we see in our biology is somehow innately us because of who we were born to be. What that misses is that we grow up and develop. We grow up as children, we grow up as adults and continue. We interact constantly with the world in which we are engaged. That's the way in which our biology actually happens. We carry our history in our bodies. How else could, how could we not?
Living in America should be a ticket to good health. We have the highest gross national product in the world. I'm very happy to finally have some of my cars in one location, some of them. We spend $2 trillion per year on medical care. That's nearly half of all the health dollars spent in the world. But we've seen our statistics. We live shorter, often sicker lives than in any other industrialized country. We rank 30th in life expectancy. Especially of economically developed countries, we are at the bottom of the list. A higher percentage of our babies die in their first year of life than in Cuba, Slovenia, Estonia. How can this be? Is this just because 47 million of us have no health insurance? Healthcare can deal with the uh, diseases and illnesses, but a lack of healthcare is not the um, cause of illness and disease. It is like saying, since um, aspirin cures uh, a fever, that the uh, lack of aspirin must be the cause of the fever. Or is it mostly because of our American diet and personal health behaviors? Those behaviors themselves, in part, determined by economic status. And so our ability to avoid smoking and eat a healthy diet depends, in turn, uh, on our access to income, education, and what we call the social determinants of health. But wouldn't our genes trump social determinants of health? Among twins who lived together until age 18, who basically grew up in the same households, so had at least a relatively similar exposure. If they diverged later in life, if one became professional and the other was working class, they ended up with different health status as adults. This is among identical twins. Written into our bodies is a lifetime of experience, shaped by social conditions and policies that can determine who will be sicker, who will die sooner. There are ways in which our society is organized that are bad for our health. Uh, and there's no doubt that we could reconfigure ourselves in ways that would benefit our health. There are huge inequalities in the society. All this wealth is maldistributed. Pet food, ice for the pet's water. And I think that's in part why the US as a whole has relatively poor health amongst the rich countries and why even the better of people are suffering. And we think that that is not inevitable. Unnatural causes. Is inequality making us sick? Coming to PBS 2008. So if we now look at the questions that we polled on, the first question asked, how does American life expectancy compare to other countries? And Mike, can you show us what our poll revealed? Yes. 41% chose B, 59% chose C. And the correct answer is 29th place. C. Um, and we are tied with South Korea and Denmark for a life expectancy of uh, 77.9 years, despite being the wealthiest country on the planet. So when we think about the emphasis that our society places on health care, it really does not fully take into account the extent to which our social circumstances contribute to our health. As this figure shows, adapted from McGinnis, 60% of our health is actually determined by our social circumstances, environment, and behavior. And only 10% is really determined by the health care that we provide. Another way to look at it is that we know a lot of attention is placed on health insurance as being directly related to health outcomes. But if we apply our equity lens to that and look more broadly, 
we're reminded that there are many additional factors that contribute to health outcomes. Beyond biological and genetic factors, we know there are care process factors, healthcare system characteristics, environmental factors, the way people utilize health care, and demographic attributes, just to name a few, in addition to social and family support. So one way to think about this when I used the analogy of an equity lens is that much like when we use a microscope and we're able to adjust the level at which we choose to focus on a sample, we can adjust the level at which we choose to focus on our patients or clients. Often we will rest right in the individual area, looking at the personal circumstances of that person, their age and sex and constitutional factors. But when we think about the concepts of social determinants of health, it's really important to take a step back and cast a broader lens that challenges us to think about the social and community networks in which that individual is operating, and also things like their educational and work environment, their living conditions, whether or not they are employed, basic needs such as water and sanitation, and housing. So in general, we're thinking about their socioeconomic, cultural, and environmental conditions when we talk about social determinants of health. Another way to look at it is social determinants of health are conditions in which we are born, grow, live, work, and age. Or another way to say it's where we live, work, and play. And we know that these circumstances are shaped by how power, money, and resources are distributed. And in cases where those resources are not necessarily distributed in the most equitable way, we may find that we have health inequities, which are the unfair and avoidable differences that we might see in health status within and between various populations. To give you an example of how this can play out, I have this slide that's from the Commission um, on Health that looks at racial and ethnic differences in health based on income. You'll see that on the y-axis, we have the percent of people who report poor or fair health. So of course, a lower number here would indicate better health. On the x-axis, we have the percent above the federal poverty level that people are living in. So here, having a higher percent means you have a higher income. What we notice is that as income increases, or as we move further along this axis, the percent of people reporting poor health decreases. And that, that's not very surprising to us. As the trailer indicated, wealth health often equals wealth and vice versa. However, what's interesting is that if we also look at how race and ethnicity influences this, we see that within each income category, whites have a better level of health than any of the other racial ethnic groups. So we see that increasing income results in fewer numbers with poor health but even within a category, being black or Hispanic is going to be associated with having poorer health. Income matters and race matters. The second quiz question asked on average, which of the following conditions is the strongest predictor of your health? And Mike, can you share with us how the group polls? Sure. Forty-one percent chose option D, whether or not you have health insurance. And we see that our answer is really based on how wealthy you are, whether or not you are wealthy. Genes, diet, and exercise and other behaviors are important. But, for example, a poor smoker still stands a greater chance of getting ill than a rich smoker. Our question number three asked, children living in poverty are how many times more likely to have poor health compared with children living in high-income households? And, Mike, our results showed... 47% chose option D seven times. And that was the correct answer. 
Children are most vulnerable they are not only when they're susceptible to substandard housing, poor food, bad schools, unsafe streets, and chronic stress, but we also know that the impacts of childhood poverty are cumulative, leading to a pileup of risks that can influence adult health and can even affect the next generation. Now, I have included a resource, Holes in the Mitten, which is from our Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. You may know that our Governor General, General Jennifer Granholm in 2007 signed Public Act 653.06 into law. And this statute was designed to address the increased rates of morbidity and mortality that we were observing in minority populations. This law mandated that the Michigan Department of Community Health, as it was then called, address racial and ethnic disparities that were facing minority populations by developing and implementing an effective statewide strategic plan. This is one of the products out of the work of the Office of Minority Health, which highlights some of the disparities that we see by race, ethnicity, and income across the state of Michigan helps us understand what some of the contributing factors might be and gives us examples of some potential interventions to close the gap. You will find this on your Blackboard uh, resource page as well. Using the data that they collected um, in this office, I want to share with you a few statistics that give us an overview or a snapshot of health disparities within the state of Michigan. And these that are coming from the Health Disparities Reduction and Minority Health section using U.S. Census data and the American Community uh, Survey. So you see that across Michigan, uh, we, do, we are a state with majority white population, uh, but within that category, we also have Arab Americans at the rate of 1.6%. Our next largest um, as the racial group is African Americans, and you can see that the third largest is Latino or Hispanic ethnicity. When we look at um, the population in the state by those categories, we start to see some very interesting patterns. And I want to stop here to mention that when we talk about race and ethnicity, we know that race in particular is a social construct that has great historical implications and really is not based on significant genetic or biological differences. However, given the history of our nation and our state and our society, over time that social construct and the privileges and advantages that were offered that were placed upon those social categories has resulted in some very real differences in quality of life and health outcome. So we're now going to look at that a little more closely so you can understand uh, what I am saying. So for example, if we were to look at the percent of the population living below the federal poverty level, across the state it would be 15 percent living below that federal poverty level. However, if we stratify it by race and ethnicity, we see that 32.7% of African Americans are living below the federal poverty level compared to 11% of whites. We also see higher levels, 29% of Arab Americans um, and 24% of American Indian Alaskan Natives. So you get very interesting results when you break down aggregate data into groups by race, ethnicity, and other social categories. And I apologize, it looks like the headings dropped off of this when I formatted it, so I will just read those to you um, as we go through. This slide uh, describes for us the percentage of the population with more than 25, uh, percentage of the population more than 25 years old that has less than a high school diploma. We see across the state, 11.6% of the population more than age 25 has less than a high school diploma. But if we break this down by race or ethnicity, it's striking to notice that our Hispanic Latino community has a 33% rate 
of less than a high school diploma. The next slide is depicting the percent of households with no vehicle available for use. And we know that transportation is very key to accessing other resources. Across the state, there's a 7.5% rate of households that have no vehicle available for use. When we break that down by race and ethnicity, we again see large numbers of African Americans, 19.1%, and American Indian Alaskan Natives, 12.2%, with no vehicle in their household available for use. And that becomes particularly important when we consider what the quality and accessibility of public transportation is for those communities. The next slide depicts the percent living in a different house than they were last year. This kind of serves as a proxy for housing stability. Across the state, it's 14.8%, but we see that there's a much uh, higher rate for our African Americans, Asians, and Latinos as compared to our white population. Now, of course, we know there could be many reasons that someone is living in a different house than last year. But I think it still begs the question why we would see such big differences. The next slide refers to self-reported health status is fair or poor. You recall I showed you that same information at the national level, and now we're able to see this at a state level. It's interesting to note that across the state, 15, almost over 14% of our population says their health status is fair or poor, and that itself is concerning. Breaking it up by race and ethnicity, we see that 27% of American Indian Alaskan Natives describe their health as being fair or poor. So we can see there is something going on when we look at these issues of race and income and health. And I would like to share with you an analogy that was developed by Dr. Kamara Jones called the Cliff Analogy for Social Determinants of Health. Often as healthcare and social service providers, we practice tertiary prevention. We treat people once they are diagnosed and try to improve their condition or rehab them or cure them. And when we're doing that, we're really operating here at the bottom where we see the ambulance. We're catching people after they have fallen off the cliff and we're trying to fix them up and help them be better. I think most people would agree, ideally, we would intervene much earlier. But all too often, our safety net programs intervene here at the blue net that's there to catch people when they fall. And that's a form of secondary prevention. People already have the problem, and we're trying to reduce the impact of it. Primary prevention is something that we really strive for when we're trying to um, prevent the problem from developing. And that's where we see the gate here, or the fence here, keeping people from falling off of the cliff. But what we might want to think about is what might we do to move people further back from the edge of the cliff. And that's really looking upstream at social determinants of health. Again, thinking about where people live, work, and play, and how that might make them less likely to get to the edge of the cliff and have to receive our services. So in thinking about social determinants of health that way, and bringing it back to our world of disability, we can start to realize that disability only becomes a tragedy when society fails to provide the things that are needed to lead one's daily life. And that moves us into thinking a little bit about what is our role in helping people lead their daily lives. And, lead, and live to their, their utmost capability. And that is what healthcare disparities focuses on. Because we know that 
we can take a snapshot for any given community at any given time and see that there are differences in the quality of life or health that they're experiencing. The data I just reviewed showed us that. And many people will say, well, I can't fix the world. I can't cure these social injustices that we see. What do you want me to do? And that's why I think it's very interesting to take a moment to focus on disparities in health care. And I use health care here, but we could use that for any of the disciplines or professions in which we practice. The question is, why might we see disparities in the quality of health that we're health of care that we're delivering? Within medicine, there was a report called Unequal Treatment that was commissioned by Congress in the early 2000s to look at quality outcomes and see if there were differences. And what they found is that there were notable differences in the quality of care that was provided in terms of treatments that were offered and treatments that were not offered. And they realized that these were happening due to multiple factors. Some of these have to do with the circumstances in which our patients or clients live. Things like whether or not they trust the system or whether or not they adhere to our recommendations or their personal or cultural beliefs that might put them at increased risk. Also, there are health system fact, uh, factors or broader institutional factors. For example, the healthcare system can be very complex and difficult to navigate. And then we can multiply that when we think about people that may have limited English proficiency or low levels of literacy. In addition, however, to the patient level factors and the health system factors, they identified a third area, which we call care process factors. And this relates to what we as providers and professionals might contribute to the equation. This has to do with things like unconscious bias and stereotyping in our decision making or communicating in a way that is not sensitive to the unique needs of a diverse population. So in effect, this report really was very important in starting the conversation around the fact that there are racial and ethnic disparities in health care and that it's multifactorial. And if we want to address them, we need to do it at multiple levels. We have made improvement, but there still is work to be done. And the National Health Care Quality and Disparities Report is something that's done annually to take a retrospective look at the previous year and give us a grade, as if you will, as a national health care system on how good of a job we're doing in providing quality care across racial, ethnic, language, income level groups. The report shows that access to health care has improved dramatically, largely due to the reductions in number of Americans that do not have health insurance and increase in the number of Americans that have a usual source of medical care. But and we know that quality of health care in general continues to improve as we have advances in medical technology and science. But still we're seeing some wide variation in how effective our treatments are, how well we're doing in coordinating care, whether or not practicing person-centered care, and how affordable care is. This is another resource I invite you to take a look at. It's available online. And you can look at any number of quality indicators to get an idea of how we're doing as a large health. So I've been using the terms health disparity and health care disparity. And if, if you'll recall, when I mention health disparity, I'm referring to differences in health outcome or status. And that can be considered basically a snapshot of how we're doing on one particular indicator. When I talk about health care disparities, though, I'm giving us a grade as providers and healthcare professionals. And it's looking at the differences in the preventive, diagnostic, and treatment services that are offered to people with similar health conditions. And it's important to make this distinction because health care disparities do not occur in a vacuum, but are rather influenced by 
all of those differences we talked about in social determinants of health and social resources. So we cannot think that as healthcare professionals we would be immune to the inequities that we see in our larger society. And we also cannot afford to think that those inequities have no impact on the quality of life and health of those we are serving. So what might be some of the factors contributing to these patterns? I mentioned that care process variables were important to consider beyond just looking at patient factors and system level factors. And we know that having providers who are not competent in disabilities can be a barrier to care. Because healthcare providers, if they have not received appropriate training and awareness, may hold incorrect assumptions and stereotypes about people with various disabilities. And those assumptions can result in inadequate care. And so many would argue that disability should be a basic and critical component of any cultural competency training and education for healthcare providers. And then within that work, that we also look more specifically at the needs of minorities with disabilities and work to get data that gives us a more accurate view. One objective of the Healthy People 2020 is that graduate students receive training related to persons with disabilities. And it also recommends that cultural competency that includes disability be required teaching and licensing components of curricula for all medical schools and health professionals training. The consequences of not having this as a requirement is that, for example, it's possible to become a board-certified physician without ever having hands-on experience with patients with developmental disabilities. People with disabilities have poorer health outcomes and use and have higher prevalence of secondary conditions like obesity. They frequently lack insurance or the necessary coverage for needed services such as specialty care or long-term care. And the care that they receive is often fragmented, going to multiple providers without having adequate coordination of services. We also know that there are barriers to preventive services that can disproportionately affect people with disability. Studies have shown that they are less likely to receive counseling for smoking cessation. They have to deal with providers who may have stereotypes and lack of appropriate training. And even the medical facilities in which they are seeking care may lack appropriate examination equipment, may not have sign language interpreters, and just are not prepared to make accommodations for individuals and their unique needs. And then on top of that, we know that uh, there are racial and ethnic disparities. And people may also have limited access to health information and are excluded from health-related research. So definitely, the disability community is a population that experiences health disparity. And within that community, we can see further challenges for those with limited English proficiency, limited health literacy, racial ethnic minorities, and other marginalized groups. Studies show that People with cognitive limitations, for example, are up to five times more likely to have diabetes in the general population and at the same time can potentially receive less adequate care in managing that disease. Disability status is as great or greater risk for unintentional injury than age, sex, gender, race, or education. And people with disabilities are one and a half times more likely to be victims of non-fatal violent crimes. We also know that mental distress, such as depression or anxiety, is a common concern for people with disabilities. And they are less likely to receive adequate social and emotional support to address those concerns. I'll now share with you some data from the AUCD and University of Illinois in Chicago that tells us a little more about some of the disparities by race and ethnicity that we might see within the population of those who have intellectual and developmental disabilities. We see, for example, that among um, adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities, 
Latinos have a much higher rate of having fair or poor mental health and fair or poor general health. We also see higher rates of obesity among blacks and Latinos as compared to whites. And we see that Latinos with intellectual developmental disabilities have much higher rates of diabetes. There was a study done by Bershasti and others that looked at race and ethnicity and its relationship to the use of preventive health care among adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. First of all, we know that there is definitely a lack of research that looks at disparities um, in this community. So this study wanted to examine the data from the National Core Indicators Project more closely. And they found that there were differences in the rates of preventive care by race and ethnicity. But when they looked at other person level factors, they did not see as much of a difference. There, were, there was also research done looking at refugees and immigrants with intellectual and developmental disabilities. This study found that strong resilience among immigrant families was definitely an a asset. However, there were challenges for this population in finding accurate information on insurance and service providers challenges with coordinating multiple specialist services, and experiences of a lack of cultural competence in virtually all levels of health service provision. And access to health care services was thought to be definitely improved when this community was treated by providers who were linguistically and culturally sensitive. And it was able to give them an experience favorable in comparison to their country of origin. I'd like to share another uh, resource with you. I quoted some of the statistics that were found from the National Core Indicators, which is a voluntary effort by public developmental disabilities agencies to measure and track their own performance. I have a screenshot here of their uh, website where you can find uh, core indicators that are standard measures used across states to assess the outcomes of services provided to individuals and families. And these indicators address key areas of concern, including, including employment, service planning, community inclusion, choice, health, and safety. Uh, this program began in 1997, and it uses information from the Adult Family Survey and also a child family survey that's mailed to the home. In addition, they have a staff stability survey. And I just gave an example here which shows the rate at which people report they do not get the services that they need. And in general, in 2014 and 15, we have 74% of those surveyed reporting they do not get the services that they need. At this site, um, you do, do have the ability to stratify and look at various race and ethnic groups. And I stratified here to see how that same question was answered by blacks or African Americans that were included in the survey. And we see that 28% um, sometimes do not get the services that they need. And 9% do not get the needed services. So that was a little interesting difference in the expected um, pattern. So in general, on virtually all measures of social determinants, adults with disabilities fare poorly. And adults with disabilities are more likely to not have high school education, much less likely for employment, less likely to have access to the internet, more likely to have an annual household income less than 15000 and more likely to have inadequate transportation. And those are social determinants of health. Now I'd like to show you another video. And, um, and this is a tale of two lives that gives us an opportunity to see how these differences in disability can result, how these differences in privilege and social determinants can result in some very real 
um, differences in quality of life. So when we think about the issue of disparities in health and health care and social determinants of health, I mentioned that we can look at that at various levels, system level factors, care process variables, and uh, patient level factors. And just as we can conceptualize that prog problem at various levels, we also have the ability to address these inequities by tackling them at these very same levels because there is something that we can do about this. One of the things that we can do is ask equity related questions. When we're developing programs or we're doing research projects or, or developing a service protocol, we should ask ourselves questions like, who are, who are the community stakeholders that we can exchange knowledge with? How can we engage them and learn from them? Thinking about the various racial, ethnic, and demographic groups that we talked about, we should want to know, are we relevant to those that we're serving? Are we understood? And is our information being presented in a useful way? When we are looking at community groups that we can partner with, we should ask, is there a sense of community ownership over this shared knowledge? Other equity questions might be, why are some people at greater risk? Where are the people we need to learn more about? How can we reach and engage them in our inquiry process? We need to remain open to understanding the lived experience of specific groups. and engage in discussion to understand how that experience relates to health outcomes and to the goals of our program, project, or service. 
and also think about how our actions might be relevant to specific populations. When we think about the social and environmental conditions of a community, it's important to ask what are the unique needs or challenges that they're facing. And in research or quality evaluations, we want to think about how we're designing our data collection and whether or not there's a way we can design that so that we can learn more about the relationships between these social determinants of health, health outcomes, behaviors, and knowledge. It's always important to ask who is accessing and benefiting from our programs and who is not. Often just a simple question of who is not at the table or who are we missing can be very powerful. We need to think about as we make decisions about the way we're going to provide care, are there barriers or differential impacts from those decisions? And if so, what, what, what can we do to change that? A great example of that might be policies that you have around how patients are seen, late policies that you have, or rules that you might have about follow-up might differentially impact sectors of our community who have limited access to transportation or have difficulty understanding written information or have limited English proficiency. So we need to always be adjusting our health equity lens to think how decisions we make and care we provide might be received differently from different groups. Another way that we can have an impact on some of these differences that we saw is to strive towards culturally competent communication. Um, there is a concept of unified health communication approach, which says that we need to think about communicating as a three-legged stool that rests equally on ensuring our communication takes into account health literacy, limited English proficiency, and cultural competency. So often, as very educated providers and professionals, we see it as our duty to transmit information to the people that we are serving or working with. But many times there are gaps in educational level or gaps in our own ability to relate to their unique social or cultural experiences. So we have to always make sure that we're thinking about whether the information we are presenting is, an understand, is being presented in an understandable way for those with limited health literacy and English proficiency, and also whether the information is being discussed in a way that shows respect for shared decision making and allows those we are serving to share their values and perspectives as we work out a plan that's going to be most suitable and efficacious for them. As we progress in our careers, we often have the opportunity to lead the direction of programs or agencies and may have the chance to really um, lead some policy changes to make sure that the services we're providing are more culturally competent. And I included this as a resource that um, tells us how to work towards reducing disparities. This is specific to healthcare organizations, but I think the roadmap can be applied to many other settings in which you're trying to implement organizational change. And one of their recommendations is that as we look at our various quality indicators, and most agencies or organizations would have those, we might want to put an equity lens on that data and just do one more bit of analysis to say, we're doing a good job here, but what happens when we break it down by level of income or English proficiency or race and ethnicity? Does it show that we're doing just as good of a job? And that could be a matter of asking for one more step of analysis when you prepare for your quarterly report so that you can share it with your team and see where there are opportunities for improvement. Another key step is creating a culture of equity. And we'll talk more about that later this week in terms of how we can build that culture among teams. But really recognizing that disparities exist 
and creating a culture where we take responsibility for addressing those disparities as they show up in our daily work. Another area is that once we find that there are gaps in quality, to be willing to have some honest discussions and do further analysis to understand what those contributing factors might be, which can then help us design interventions to close those gaps and work with our leaders to secure buy-in and resources that will help us implement change. So now let's go to question number four. The most important factor behind the 30-year increase in U.S. life expectancy that we saw during the 20th century was, and Mike, if you can tell us how we responded to that. 53% of participants chose B, social reforms. And that's very good. That is the correct answer. Because we do know that since we're focusing on social determinants of health, um, in order to have the types of positive impact that we want to have on closing disparities or gaps in quality of health and well-being, it's going to take us looking at social changes, better wages, housing, social security, job security, working conditions, civil rights laws, sanitation, and other protections that improve our health by improving our lives. And those involve social reform, and they also involve addressing uh, policy. Uh, now, it's very interesting to note that um, federal policy does not identify people with disabilities or uh, subgroups of people um, with uh, disabilities as uh, medically underserved um, populations. So as a result, uh, medical students and residents who are interested in working with these populations are not eligible for federal loan repayment programs. And in addition, there are no incentives for research and database development because we do not have this designation. So that's a great example of how policy decisions can affect our ability to advance our knowledge in this field and to provide more culturally competent uh, care providers to serve this population. So in general, I pose the question, what are we working towards when we do this work? And often people will interchange the terms equality and equity. But I like to include this uh, image to help us understand some important differences between the two. In this first uh, image, you see that we have three children who are reaching for the same objective. They all want to see the baseball game. And for our work, we could say our objective is that we want everyone to enjoy a, the greatest quality of life that they are able to to have the best health outcomes that they are able to. Uh, in this first diagram, you'll notice that they were all given a little bit of assistance. Everyone was given the same size box to stand on to try to meet that objective. They're being treated equally. You'll notice, however, they did not all meet the desired objective. When we look at the second image, we see that individuals are given what they need in order for them to have equal access to viewing the game. The child that was of the uh, lowest height was given more so that he could see the game and have access to that, the same as someone who maybe did not need that at all. This is equity. However, to challenge our thinking a bit more and really think more about the larger societal and structural and system issues that impact our ability to reach those outcomes. We can see in the third image that if we remove some of the barriers that have been placed at a system level, all three can see the game without any supports or accommodations because the inequity was addressed and the system barrier was removed. So I would challenge us to think about, in our work, what are the boxes that we as providers might place to help people reach the outcome in spite of the barriers that they face? 
And especially from a policy standpoint and from a leadership standpoint, where are there opportunities for us to work to remove the barriers so that everyone has access to the desired outcome? And so I'll just end uh, the formal uh, presentation portion with this quote from Dr. Martin Luther King, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health care is the most shocking and inhumane. And now I will uh, pause for questions. We have a question from Molly. Uh, Molly, I unmuted your microphone. If you'd like to go ahead and ask that question, it seems to be a, a pretty lengthy one. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Go ahead. Okay, mine's more of a comment. Um, I think this is a great topic, um, but it was very interesting to me um, with your questions to the audience because um, in medical school, they've actually taught us different answers than what um, you presented, which I think contributes um, further to the biases that you talked about. Um, for example, um, the question about what's the strongest predictor of somebody's health, in medical school they've taught us the answer is whether or not you smoke. Um, and then for question four, the biggest contributor to the um, increasing life expectancies, we've learned it's the development of modern hospital system and technologies is the most important contributing factor. Um, so I just found that very, very interesting, um, just the discrepancy between this presentation and what they're telling them in medical school. And it's, you know, kind of just overlooking um, all of these determinants and how they really do affect um, patients and things like that. So just a very interesting observation. That, that, that's a great point. And I think that when we don't stratify the data by race, ethnicity, and zip code, and these other variables that we discussed, often we don't notice these differences. So it will be very interesting to forecast 10 years from now to see if that is still being taught. Um, but I, you know, when we look at data like the National Healthcare Disparities Report, it makes it very clear that in spite of the technological advances, not everyone is progressing at the same rate. So I think it really highlights, um, we know the data can be a tricky thing. It all depends on the questions that you ask. And that's why I really emphasize that, that if we don't ask the question, we won't know. So I really appreciate that point. That, that's really important that you made. Thank you. My, my basic uh, comment is I think that if your head is spinning a little bit after this session, I feel like I've uh, done my job because we really want to challenge you to ask more questions uh, about the data that you're seeing and the people that you're seeing and really try to think about them in context. Um, I think that the most important question you can ask, as I said, is, is the service I'm providing affecting one population differently? Who's missing at the table? If you start to see patterns that are different than you expect, ask why might this be occurring? And really challenge yourself to think about what do I need to understand about where this patient lives, works, and plays, and how their access to housing, transportation, healthy food, and a host of other social determinants of health might be impacting the way they are presenting to you the patterns of health seek, help seeking that you see and the way that they are managing their condition or advocating um, for their condition. Great. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>